The purpose of this video is to pass on to future generations some of the solos that I have run and to explain some of the techniques which are seldom used in the United States now. This video would never have come into being if it had not been for the skill, interest, and the imagination of Tom, Tom Sullivan. He not only has done all the photographic work, taking scenes when they were at their best, regardless of the inconvenience to himself, but he's doing all the editing and assembling. I'm very beholden to Tom, as are you, the viewers. I'm also very grateful for the help, advice, and criticism of Ann Hall, J. O'Callaghan, Natalie and Aaron Loomis, and Susan Cornell. Without all of them, this video would be nothing but a pleasant dream. You're going to hear several bits of music, some of the, uh, some of the songs up, uh, to explain the ideas that I want to illustrate. Some are for the pleasure of hearing good music, and some are the fun of watching the bell ringing. I hope you'll have a pleasant hour, and it will evoke many memories in the future. Welcome to the home of Pudding Hill Ringing in Marshfield for 35 years or so. As you were looking about, you heard the bells ringing. Now you'll have a chance to see where they were ringing and who was ringing them. people have probably influenced my career in bell ringing 
and of course starting with Mrs. Shercliffe, who kindled an interest in uh, bell ringing in Boston, which spread like wildfire through the United States and beyond. And one of the sparks from that fire ignited in me. Then came Mrs. Hughes, wife of the owner of the Whitechapel Foundry in London, Mr. Albert Hughes. Hearing her ring solo at uh, a Castle Hill festival of the New England Guild in Ipswich inspired me to attempt it. But most of the encouragement I got came from fellow bell ringers Fred Fay and Jack Grove, who uh, accompanied me whenever they could, who composed music for me, and who urged me to do more. But probably the biggest push came from Dick Littest, the president of the American Guild and the leader of the foremost, one of the foremost bell ringing groups in the United States, the Martin Ringers of Rockford, Illinois. He invited me to join them in ringing a Brahms intermezzo at the National Festival in Orono, Maine. And two years later, at, uh, we added the Beethoven Sonata Pathétique, and uh, I rang that at the Dallas Convention as in the opening concert with them. I have a recording of that concert, and I think you'll enjoy it. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
showed several friends samples of what we thought the video would be like, we found they thought more points should be brought in. Natalie and Aaron Loomis are kind enough to help me do this. Thanks so much for coming again. You had questions the other night when we were doing the video part the ringing part, and now we have a chance to talk about them. Yes, I would like to know how you got interested in this unusual activity. Well, some college friends of mine, or some school friends of mine after I graduated from college, were ringing at uh, Christmas Eve on Lewisburg Square, the Shercliffe <coughs> children. Well, they were not children then. And uh, I asked if I could join the group. And Mrs. Shirtcliffe invited me, and I went. She invited everybody, and, she, and I went. So, uh, I don't know why I was invited. Why do you think I was invited, Alan, as a guest? Well, you have a powerful <laughs> personality, oh, pleasant yeah. to be around. Yeah. It wasn't your skill. You told me that previously. I never r had rung a bell before. Yeah, well, so, that's good. You so were, uh, I was a neophyte. She yeah, was that's interested. Good. I think I, I couldn't was read music, interest. and I knew nothing about music really, and I had never handled a bell. But <laughs> it just was something that I liked to do. So I did it. And for many years, you played in a group. Yes. And then eventually, you became a soloist. Well, when I started ringing, I was taking care of my mother, and teaching school, and. Uh, it was mother's last illness, and so I was on duty every evening mm. until the next morning. And therefore, I couldn't always go to the bell groups. And I thought, well, if I had my own set of bells, maybe I could, look, you know, keep up that way. So I got a set of bells, which was, at that time, Mrs. Shirtcliffe said, 18 bells was more than enough. 12 bells would do, so I got 12 bells from England, and they finally came, and I started learning Brown's Little Dust Man, <laughs> and became sufficiently accomplished in that, so that we rang in a concert at one of the uh, organization festivals up at Castle Hill, and Mrs. Shercliffe's other ringers did the accompaniment behind me. Mm. And I was the first one ever to do it. Remarkable. Nobody ever ever done it before. So that was nice. <laughs> and you have rung not only in Massachusetts, but in Europe. Yes. Uh, my next big achievement, which uh, you'll hear it on the, on the videotape, uh, was in England where I went with a group from Rockford, Illinois. And the leader of that group had come to know me and he decided, uh, we talked about solo ringing, and I don't know that he'd ever heard me solo ring because I tried not to do it where anybody, anybody would hear me. Mm -hmm. And he, but anyway, he asked me what I had to ring, and I told him I had Brahms in the mezzo. And so he said, oh, that would be good. Will you ring with us? We're going to England. Mm -hmm. And no, that was my, I didn't go to England with that. I went to England. After that, when I also rang uh, Beethoven's uh, Pathétique, and they rang behind me. And then we went down to Kansas and rang there another year, and we went down and opened the conference in Texas another year, and I've just rung around, both in Massachusetts and outside Massachusetts. And the music, is it written? Four bells, or do you take music and adapt it to your bells? The music looks just like regular music uh, until comparatively recently, which I I would say was uh, fifteen years ago. Mm. It was all adapted music, but uh, now there are compositions written just for bells. And there was no music published until after the war for bells. That well, you're too modest to music. say that music was written for you, to honor you. Well, I think that's I had, neat. <laughs> <laughs> I had some people who accompanied me, and one of them, the piece that is, is been printed, was, was written because the composer thought I couldn't do it. Oh. And I didn't know that, 
So, of course, I tried very hard to do it, <laughs> and I succeeded. Good and he you. was so pleased with it that he's now published it. And uh, he's <laughs> under the headline, he said that I had rung it as a solo. He hasn't written it as a solo. I had rung it as a solo by rearranging the bells as I was the Horowitz of handbell ringers. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ha have some questions about the bells? Certainly do. I'm interested in how they are made. Uh, the bells are always cast, I understand. From That's you. right. So I wondered how they're finished off. A casting is rough. How is the bell made so nice and smooth? Oh, well, it's put on a lathe mm -hmm. and turned. Yeah. And then uh, when it gets down pretty near what they really smooth the way they want it, they then tune it by taking off some of the metal. Mm. They told me that they always cast them uh, sharp because you can lower a bell, but you can't fill it up. Uh, fill it up. If yeah. a bell is cracked they, or is out of tune, they can change it mm. uh, by lowering it to the next half note. Yeah. Well, when they tune it, are they do they tune it to a pitch pipe or? A they tune, tune it to a, a, a electronic thing. I don't know what you call it. Oh. Okay. All right. Well. Years and years, centuries ago, the first bell ringers' bells were made. Were the shape and the weight and so forth recorded at that time and passed down through the ages? I don't know for sure, but I rather suspect that each foundry had its own method. Yeah. And they all developed relatively the same way, yeah. but different, uh, settled on different pitches. Yeah. And then they found out that it was more convenient, and the bell ma the bell ringers liked it better if they were all tuned to the symphonic mm. pitch, yeah. which is what they do now, concert yeah. pitch. Hmm. Well, I wondered if a bell of a certain shape and size, made of say cast iron, will have the same note as a bell of that particular shape and size and weight made of bronze. Well, they would. Uh, but they wouldn't sound the same. The tone would be there. I don't know what you call it. The resonance the, would be the different. The resonance would be different. The quality of the tone would be different. Yeah. Uh, as I have read it, the thing that gives the handbells, the bronze handbells, the tone is the tin that's in them. I don't oh. know that for a pit, for a certainty, but I understood that that's what gave them the brilliance. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You also asked me at one time, when we were talking before, uh, whether a bell, if one bell is cast, if the next bell would be just exactly the same. Uh, as far as I know, it would. One thing the man told, uh, Mr. Mar uh, Markey told me that I thought was very interesting is there's no way of knowing the imperfections of a bell, uh, which may develop later. Mm. There is no x-ray that shows you anything. And that uh, you certainly do not use every bell that you cast. Yeah, I see. Hmm. That book that I gave you, I think, will answer a lot of questions you may have. Well, I have five books. I look forward to reading them, yeah. Hmm. Anything else? No, I think that fills me in pretty well on the, the mechanics of how they're made. I don't know the ratio of thickness here. What do you call this part of the bell up here? I think they call it the head of the bell. The head of the bell. That's a lot thicker than the lip. Yeah. And it tapers down yeah. gradually. Yeah. Doesn't? Well, as I understand it, they have to go back from the lip to the back, making all the overtones exactly right by tuning them in. Right? One thing he told, another thing he told me was that every foundry has its own imprint on what they call the finger guard. You'll notice they have uh, sort of flowers on ours. Yeah. And yeah. every that's the way you tell what, what the foundry yeah. was. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Most interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And this particular bell that I'm holding is one of the lower notes. Very much so. The bigger the bell, the lower the, the, the note. The bigger the bell, the lower Are the note. Are the clappers always formed like that? Uh, the English the Whitechapel ones are. I don't know about the I mean, other with foundries. A felt, the American uh, foundries. Felt, felt, I didn't no. realize they had a felt nib to it or whatever they you don't. call it. That's uh, metal. See, if you look at it carefully, yeah. you see this is metal here. And starting with 
what we call middle C, but actually is an octave higher than middle C, they put felt on them, oh. which uh, makes them less clang, clang oh. I have put on some of my a lo a higher bells, I've put a little piece of felt right here <laughs> on the tip of it uh, as, the, as the leather gets hard. Oh, yeah. What you probably should do is to put in new pegs, but uh, I don't do that. No. And the white chapel doesn't think highly of my way. <laughs> Your bells are always beautifully polished. Oh, you got to keep them that way. Well, you do clean them. They Once add lacquer or something, do you? You never should touch the metal. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because I thought, shall I say that yeah. to him? And then I thought, no, but you brought it up for yourself. Well, why don't you lacquer them and preserve the polish? Uh, they, you can do that, but uh, they don't advise it. They oh. think it's better to leave it this way. The don't tone. ask me why. I'd be happy to lacquer a couple. For you to well, it, prob out. it would probably change the pitch, change the tone. Oh, you think so? Well, anyway. I don't do it. You don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> the bell is cursed. These are white chapel bells. They're made in English England. bells. And as far as I know, there are other English foundries that make them the same way because a friend of mine got some that were called Warner Bells, old, the same age as these, and they were the same. Mm. And they fit very nicely with the White Chapel. She made a three octave set out of the old Warner Bells. Now this is cast without any uh, clapper in it. And the head of the bell, you can't see it very well here, but the head of the bell comes down in here, uh, about an inch, I would say. And the clapper is completely separated. Mm. The clapper ha it screws in, and it has this washer which separates the metal from this metal so that there's no contact there. And then to keep the, to keep the clapper from hitting the bell, there are two springs which are attached like that and move back and forth. And when I strike the bell, the force of my strike bends this back enough so it hits the side of the bell. But I can also move it and it prevents it from hitting the side of the bell if I don't move it too hard or stop it too soon. And this screws in, if you can find the hole, and it's supposed to be finger tight. When you polish the bells, you take these out. Do the clappers wear out and have to be replaced? or? No? Well, I've had these since uh, the war, 50 years. Well, that's pretty so good, yeah, I guess. I don't think they wear out very easily. Uh, now, the bell should be... Whoa. Too tight? No, I got the... Oh, you forgot that. Uh, no, I didn't forget it, and it came off. Cross-threaded. Uh. I'm glad it did. On the side of the spring, there are these two little sponges that the Whitechapel people attach to the spring with sealing wax. Mm. Uh -huh. And if you try to, because they have their own way and they don't, they have the the candle and everything. You have to heat this, then you have to heat the spring, and then you have to put it on. And the clap is in the way, and it is a headache. So I use duco cement. <laughs> no, uh, uh. But I must remember that that's out. Now, now if you notice, I don't have that paper on, and if you notice uh. that hits. Uh, yeah. If I turn it the other way where the spring is, it won't hit. Uh. Because this keeps that's it... That's an important part it's of the It's a very important part. I was ringing one time and I went this way and the thing went sliding out into the room and I Ooh. thought, what am I going to do? I had to remember always to do it on the same side and then very carefully see I can't I can't even roll it. So if I if I wanted to get it to the top, I had to very carefully get it and then get it down so I'd only get a so it was quite a Which complication. Is difficult in a yeah. concert. Now with the White Chapel bells, this clapper uh, is the same all the way up. But there's a little protrusion at the end of the clapper which makes it go beyond the lip of the bell, as you can see if I hold the bell up like that. Yeah. And that adds weight to the clapper. 
So you can't saw that off or cut it off or anything. The American bells have their clapper completely inside the rim. Uh -huh. They don't have a clapper like this at all. I'll come to them later. I'll finish with this, I guess. Uh, this is metal. And then there are leather pegs that are stuck into the clapper on either side. And up to, as I said before, up to the Middle Sea, the uh, clappers are all, from Middle Sea to the octave above it, the clappers are all leather and not covered. From Middle Sea up to the, uh, from the sea above Middle Sea to the next sea, uh, they have plastic, mm -hmm. the little round pegs. And from the sea down, they have, uh, I don't know what you call the felt, I guess, uh, wrapped around the clapper. And it's very, there's a very careful way of winding it down below that I don't know about. I have put them on, but uh, I wouldn't think, I don't think that I would be approved. Uh, in fact, I put them on with rubber bands, which I know would not be accepted. <laughs> now, the American bells, all the ones that I've seen anyway, the clapper is inside here, and they're round, and the clapper is not part of the bell. It's, it's I think I'm right in saying this, it does not come out, but there is a spring assembly, as there would have to be, inside here, and the round head of the clapper can be rotated so that you can have a soft side and a hard side. I don't know how you do it because I haven't got one of those bells. And there is, on the Marmark bells and probably on the Schumerick bells, there is a point in this circle which is the best point for, they call it the strike point. And so your clapper should be lined up with that. Because they're all of them are called English handbells, whether they were made in England, Japan, or where they're made, because they can only be sounded in one plane, that way. They can't be sound, sounded sideways. So it's a rigid clapper. That makes it an English handbell. Now, what other, other things? You could play these bells with the American bells, and they would be the same pitch or tone, I'm not